Cherry Street, like Brookside. All right, then we'll go ahead and get started. Did everybody get a chance to say thank you to all the sponsors? They, uh, you know, they, they work hard and help us have great conferences like this. So if you haven't yet, go say thank you to uh, one of those great sponsors up there. We're talking about SQL for JSON today, specifically in NoSQL databases. Let's just make sure we know where we are here. This is the uh, Tulsa Tech Fest Twitter account. So if you want to follow them for future announcements, it might be a good idea. Let's just make sure I know who I am. I'm Matthew Groves. I work for Couchbase as a developer advocate. I have a Twitter account there. I also have a podcast and blog, so appreciate if you check that out. Or if you guys want to be on an episode, you got something cool to talk about, I'd love to have you on. I have some really impressive acronyms here. Let's just all take a minute to admire them. Anybody in my first session this morning? Well, oh, good because I made that same joke earlier. Um, the, no, seriously. Uh, I really live by this statement here. I'm not an expert. I'm an enthusiast. I'm, you know, I'm not up here as some guru of, of knowing everything. I'm just on a journey like you guys, trying to learn and, and improve myself and, and talk about cool stuff. During the course of today's session, if you guys would tweet something interesting that you've learned, or a picture, or a joke about how funny I look, uh, as long as you use the hashtag Couchbase so my boss knows that I'm not here messing around, I would appreciate that. And if you do that, I've got some stickers for you. Really cool Couchbase stickers. So come on up afterwards and I'll give you one. I only have a limited supply though, so first tweet, first serve. Uh, let's get this out of the way here first. Does anybody know, ever heard of CouchDB? Uh, this is not CouchDB. Uh, Couchbase is the CouchDB, like MySQL is the SQL Server. It's the same acronym. Some early on in both products, there were some people who worked on both, but they're not a fork of each other. They're not the same company. CouchDB is uh, Apache Foundation, and Couchbase is Couchbase Inc. And we are an open source product. All of our stuff is open source, um, but it's just separate from CouchDB. So that's always something that comes up, so I thought I'd get that out of the way early. Okay. So today we're going to talk about SQL for JSON and how we can be performant with that and how we can use SQL in a NoSQL database. So this is today's agenda. That's what we're going to kind of cover. Um, one thing to note, I picked .NET because I thought this would be a .NET heavy group. Is that the case? Most, mostly Microsoft developers in here. So I'm picking .NET just because I had to pick one, but there's also APIs for Java and um, Node and Ruby and all, all, the, all that good stuff. Okay, so let's talk about no SQL here, briefly. So major companies, major enterprises are adopting NoSQL. These are some logos from just Couchbase's customers who are using NoSQL in various parts of their organization. I'm not saying they use exclusively us or exclusively NoSQL, but they are adopting NoSQL. So all these different uh, companies, you know, Couchbase calls this the digital economy. These are uh, companies that are sort of using NoSQL to drive more modern uh, data-driven applications. Um, so that's just sort of the big takeaway is that a lot of these, all these different industries, so we got technology, of course, you know, they're in, on the NoSQL bandwagon, but even games and even some, uh, you know, traditional media entertainment companies are using, are using NoSQL. So why? Why are they using NoSQL? Well, I mean, SQL databases are great. Relational databases are fantastic. They're, they're time-tested, they've been around for a long time, and they're not going to go away. They give you a lot of functionality, you know, a great set of abstractions, tables, and columns, and stored procedures, and uh, asset transactions, and so on, and at a reasonable cost, and that cost is going down, not just in terms of money, but also in complexity. But I think there's one thing that SQL doesn't handle as well as NoSQL databases, and that's, and that's change. And what I mean by change is both logical change and physical change. And we'll talk about what that means here. So NoSQL databases tend to address the problem of change with four different aspects. And, and we're going to cover those here. So it's agility, scalability, performance, and availability. So let's talk about agility first. With NoSQL, your data is stored in a document. And in Couchbase, that's a JSON object. It's very similar across the board for NoSQL, just a, a JSON um, object that contains uh, fields and uh, sub-objects and arrays and so on. 
And there's no rigid schema. You don't have to define a structure of that object before you save it. You just save a JSON object. So you get some schema flexibility there. And that helps you to respond to change faster because you don't have to worry about adding columns, changing columns. Is this column really going to be one that we need? Is it the right length? Is it the right data type? And so on. So, I mean, you can do what you want with these documents. It doesn't mean you should. You should have some discipline about the type of documents you create and the structure of those documents. So while you, you, know, while you can do something, doesn't mean you should do something. That being said, you do get some flexibility with the schema in, in NoSQL. So with scalability, a lot of the SQL databases, you can size your cluster of machines based on your needs for right now. So with a, a traditional relational database, you might have one server, and to, to handle more demands on that server, you would upgrade to a, a faster processor, more RAM, et cetera. With a NoSQL database and Couchbase, it's more like a cluster of machines that all work together as one. So to scale that up, you just add in more machines to that cluster. So for instance, if it's a busy time of the year, maybe uh, Christmas time or back to school time, you can scale up to handle more demand on your resources. And then when things uh, quiet down, you can then take those machines back offline and save some money. And you don't have to use really expensive hardware to do this. You can just use commodity machines, you know, cloud machines or, or just some you know, inexpensive server you throw on the rack and they'll help you scale up your uh, capacity. So just as an example, one of our customers is there is Comcast. And they use uh, NoSQL they use our database to handle their, um, I think it's in Europe, it's called Sky TV, uh, where you, you get the channel guide on your screen and you can see, you know, you, whenever you change a channel, that's an API request that, uh, that Sky handles and that goes to Couchbase and so on. So for instance, during a soccer game or when Game of Thrones is about to come on, like everybody in the world is changing channels to HBO. So right before Game of Thrones comes on, you may want to scale up your capacity to handle that. And then when the Game of Thrones is over, you can scale back down because now it's more spread out and it's not all at once. You know, a new episode of Game of Thrones or maybe the finale of Game of Thrones, that sort of thing. Uh, another example is, I think this is also with Comcast, is during the week they may have some show that uh, you can interact with. You can vote for contestants on the show. And the voting happens one day of the week. So you scale up that day of the week, add more machines, handle the votes, when voting's over, you can scale back down to normal or, you know, just one node or whatever you need for every day work there. Black Friday is another good example. Um, so think of it like a, like a big sandwich like this. You know, this, this is a huge sandwich. And uh, I could cut off pieces of the sandwich or hand out pieces to everyone. Or I could just order, a pl you know, 20 sandwiches and spread them out evenly, right? So you can scale up literally with a sandwich, or you can scale out with multiple sandwiches. Performance. So in the performance area, I don't like to get in too much of the benchmark stuff because it's very subjective. No SQL systems are designed for some specific access patterns. And uh, you know, the low response time really helps with web and mobile user experience. You get some millisecond latency, for instance. But, but perf can be very subjective. So I just want to focus on the architecture of Couchbase as a built-in caching layer. So most of the data you'll be accessing will come directly from RAM instead of having to make the trip to the disk every time. So that really helps Couchbase give some of those really good perf numbers. So you know, to get into perf details with you, you can, you can ask a question, but my answer is probably going to be it really depends on what you're doing, you know, what kind of resources you have, what your use cases are, et cetera. And finally, availability. So I, I said earlier that you can scale out multiple nodes into a cluster, multiple machines. And if one of those machines goes down, that's fine. The other machines in the cluster will pick up the slack. They may have copies of the documents, um, replicas, that will be promoted to active. So you'll just continue providing the same service without having to go down. Uh, you know, for maintenance reasons or someone trips over the, the, uh, you know, the Ethernet cables or whatever. Just like at a fountain machine here, if this Pepsi runs out, well, then maybe this Pepsi has some left in it. So I'll just go over there. 
And when we talk about NoSQL, it's kind of a catch-all term. It's kind of meaningless, too, because really it just describes what it isn't. And it's increasingly inaccurate, as you're going to see later on. But when we talk about NoSQL, there's really these four categories of, of, uh, of products here. So with key value, we have some functionality in Couchbase to do that. That's basically where you have a key and you have some random value. It can be anything. It doesn't really matter what it is. So we see uh, tools like uh, Redis is in that department as well. Redis, I think, is completely in RAM. There's no, uh, by default, there's no disk storage there. And then document, which is kind of like key value, but a little more evolved, because now the value, you can reason about it. It's a JSON document. So we can, we can say, well, let's look at documents that have a field with this value, or a, uh, you know, an array of, of this, these values. And the big player there is, is Mongo. They're very, very popular in the document data space. And, Couchbase is also there. Uh, graph is really interesting. I'm not going to talk about it that much, but graph is where the relationships between data actually have information as well. So some very cool things you can do with graph databases. And wide column, like Cassandra, is the big player there, which is similar to a document database, but you get a little more structure in terms of setting up key value pairs in your, in your data rows. So I'm going to mainly focus on document database, and I'm going to use Couchbase as my example for this session. But there's lots of players in there. Uh, Amazon DynamoDB is a, is a big one. And Microsoft has one called DocumentDB, which has some really cool functionality. Those are both uh, cloud-based document databases. So I want to start by talking about um, J uh, data modeling in JSON. I'm going to start with a use case like this, which I drew myself, as you can tell. I want to model a customer in a, uh, a JSON document, a single document. So this is sort of my requirements. I have a person here. It's, her name is Helen Mallory, and her birthday is the same as mine. What do you know? And uh, she has uh, some billing options, so she can pay with this credit card or that credit card if she decides to. She has some connections, friends, or people she follows or whatever. Those are just other, other customers in the data. And then a history of her purchases. So she bought a laptop and some sort of smartphone there. And so that represents a customer right now. And we can see that we have some sort of complex things going on. So we have these two simple just sort of attributes. But we have this collection of information. Each of these has their own attributes, you know, card number, expiration date, and so on. These are references to other documents. And then this is another complex relationship maybe references to other documents or, or maybe not. So let's look at how we might model this. Let's start with something you're probably familiar with, the relational model of this. So this might be one way you could do it. You have a, a customer table, and there's a, you know, some sort of foreign key relationship to a contacts table, to a purchases table, maybe a multi-key relationship. So you maybe have some mapping tables in here too that are not pictured. And um, so we have five normalized tables that a customer is, is spread out amongst. And so each time you want to construct a customer object, you have to do a join amongst these tables. And each time you persist a customer, make changes, you have to persist them to five plus tables. The relationships between them are enforced by referential constraints. And then the objects are, are uh, constructed by joins every time. And then additional values of the same type are managed by additional rows in one of those tables, right? So if I have multiple contacts to the customer, I maybe have three contacts here, I add a fourth one, and, and so on. So that's a one-to-end type relationship there. And then what about structure evolution? What about we want to make changes to this? So making changes within a table, we need to alter the table. So that might require some downtime, it might require some migration, it might require some versioning, things like that. So this is one of the problems that NoSQL databases are trying to address by using a more flexible schema. I'm not saying this is bad. This is a perfectly reasonable way to model it in a relational database. But I want to show you how we might model that as a JSON document instead. So let's start very simply here. We have one row here. This is our primary key. And we have two uh, properties there for Jane Smith. The way we'd model that very simply in a document is we have the document has a key which sort of roughly corresponds to this primary key here. Then we have a JSON object with two fields, name and date of birth. 
So the primary key becomes the document key, and then the column name, column value becomes the key value pairs in a JSON document. So does that seem like it makes sense so far? I know this is very, very simple. I just want to make sure we're sort of on the same page before we get any further. Okay? All right, another option we could do is we could break it down even further. We could break this down into um, a sort of sub-object here, first name and last name. We could add middle name. We could add suffix, title, whatever else you wanted to add in there. So that's another way of you, you could model it. Okay. Now let's bring in billing to the equation. We have one or more credit cards on file for this customer. And normally that's a, like a foreign key. This would point to this customer here. So we could have multiple different billing methods in the database. The way we'd model that over here in JSON is we'd say, okay, billing is our field, and we'll have an array that contains one or more payment objects. And each of those objects has these properties, type, card number, expiration date. So we've gone from two tables to one document. So this is all sort of embedded together in one place. If we wanted to add an, another payment method, we'd just add another object to this array. So far, so good? OK. Now let's look at the connection. So this are the friends or followers type of situation. Very similar, so we'll have some relation table. This is a simplified version. Probably you'd want to represent this in two mapping tables in, in relational situation, but for simplification, I'm going to put them in, in one table with two rows. So here's, again, a foreign key. Maybe this is the connection ID that identifies who they are and then their, their name. So down here, this is one way we could do it. We could say connections, another JSON array with two objects in it. That's one way we can model it. Um, the other thing we could do is we could keep just the connection ID in here. And so it would be a reference to some other document that we could then navigate to that document to get the customer information. Or we could just store part of it here, maybe just for convenience, their name. So now we're storing the same data in two different places, which is not terrible. We have plenty of disk space. But you may or may not want to do that. That's, that would be a data modeling, data modeling decision you'd have to make. And finally, let's bring it all together here. We're adding on purchases. And it's just another field here with an array and two more JSON objects in there with uh, the Mac and the iPad that, that this customer purchased. So we have all these tables, five plus tables, combined into one JSON document. So any questions on that so far before we move on? Go right ahead. Is there a reason why customer ID is or a Dylan Smith is on in this one? Is that a same customer ID kind of connection? I've looked at these slides probably a hundred times and never noticed that. <laughs> I, it, there's no, yeah, I, I think it's probably just a mistake. There's no comma there either. Should run these through a JSON linter first, huh? But, I mean, hypothetically, it could be another customer. So, good catch, though. I'm going to fix that, if I remember. Yeah, go ahead. So, when we set up the structure of the document, we shouldn't change any of the key names. So, like, connections will be called connections always. I mean, that, that would be my advice to you, is to not change that from document to document. That way, it's the same across all your documents. There's nothing in Couchbase that enforces that. So it's just a good practice to say, okay, yeah, connections are always called connections. They're not called my connections or the connections. Go ahead. Um, on our relations, you have the name of uh, Joe Smith. And yeah. On the top, you have uh, Jim Smith. Yes. Um, how does that map that? Well, they're two different people. So Jane Smith is right here. Her key is CBL 2015. Here's Joe Smith here. His key is XYZ987. So two different people there. There might, there might be another document in the bucket, as we call them, that has this as the document key. 
So they're related. It's just like, it's kind of like a foreign key. Yeah? Just want to make sure of something. So the fact that you're repeating the names under the connections, they refer to other documents, other customer documents. They, they could, because yes. you've got the names there. Is that just for simplification to kind of communicate to us what it is? But in reality, that might be repeated data? Well, so, I mean, yes. You're, you're, everything you said is right. Okay. Uh, it is for clarification, but it's also, you could choose to put the name there for convenience sake if you wanted to. Or you could just put the cust ID there. That would be totally fine as well. Um, but, but yeah, the idea is these would, these would probably be other documents. You could have a relationship with those, those documents. But it's yes. not for performance sake or something where we're not joining anymore. Just to be able to pull it down in one document. I mean, I don't, I don't see much of a performance saving in doing that. It might just be for convenience of, I don't have to make two calls now, I just make, make one. Although, as we see with, with Nickel later on, it's not, even, it's not even a bother of making multiple calls. So You're getting ahead of me, I think. That's what's going on. <laughs> okay, any more questions about this design? Yeah, go ahead. I just want to make sure I'm understanding correctly. Um, so the, the biggest benefit is that with the relational database, you're having to make uh, different joins on every single table and update five different tables at one time. That, that is one benefit, yes, absolutely, yeah, right. I should be repeating the question in case you guys didn't hear it, so I'm sorry about that. Okay, was there another one I thought I saw over here? No? Okay. All right, so this is just sort of a summary of what I'm talking about. Uh, you know, this relational, it's got some, some good properties there. I mean, again, there's, there's nothing wrong with relational. I'm not here to dump on relational databases. They're totally fine. They have a lot of great benefits. Um, one of the things especially you can do with relational is query them, which is something that, you know, you guys have probably been using SQL for years and years and years, and I've been using SQL for over a decade. So it's something I'm very comfortable with. With NoSQL, though, you don't really see a lot of query languages like SQL out there, at least as rich as SQL. There may be some versions of it or some alternate way to query that data, but nothing that's really as, as expressive and powerful and something that you know as well as SQL. Until now. Ah, you like that segue? So we're going to talk about SQL for JSON and why SQL for no JSON. And that's basically what I just said. So, you know, no SQL systems generally provide some specialized APIs to access the data. So you can get a document by the key or set it by the key. You can create a script, like a map reduce query to query that data out, to filter it or select certain documents. And some NoSQL databases have a very, very limited set of declarative uh, query languages. So MapReduce can be nice, but it, it does make certain operations harder. You know, try to do, do a join or a union with a MapReduce is very difficult. It requires a lot of extra code. And it's, this is not going to feel as natural, at least not to me, as a SQL query does. If you've been using it as a long time, especially it's just sort of part of my brain, right? Joins and unions. So let's just look at an example here. The specifics of this aren't important, but I want to sort of demonstrate what you might have to do without something like SQL for JSON or SQL for a NoSQL database. So if we had a query, we want to find our high value customers. These are customers that have a total orders that equal up $10,000 or more. Right? So these customers have bought a lot of products, uh, a lot of purchases. We want to sum them up and find the ones that have spent a lot of money. So we'd have to start by getting all the customer objects from the database. So that, that might be a tough operation right there, just to say, give me all the documents that are customers. Now, there's some ways you can do that. Maybe a MapReduce query. Then we have to say, in our code, for each customer object, find all the orders for that customer. So they may be in those documents, or they may be in a separate document. Now you have to go through each one and, and find those orders. Calculate the total amount for each order. So each order could consist of multiple items. We have to sum up those items into an order. Then we have to sum it up again, the grand total for all the orders for that customer. And if it's greater than $10,000, we want to emit that customer. Say, yes, that one is the one we want. Otherwise, we just skip it. We add that to the high value customer list, and then we do it again. We loop through, could be millions of customers, right? And then at the very end, we've got to sort it. Sort the high-value customer, high value customer list. So what we end up with, if we do this with normal NoSQL database operations, is some complex code, complex logic, that's most likely living maybe halfway in your application, maybe halfway in your database. 
So I, you know, I could do this with our key value calls and our map reduce, but it's, it's going to be more complex, more inefficient. It's just not going to be as, as natural as SQL. So the goal of querying for JSON is to provide that, provide that for developers. But SQL is meant for normalized data. So what do we do when we have denormalized data, like those JSON documents I showed you in the modeling earlier? So what's happening is the SQL empire strikes back. And they say, okay, that's cool. We're doing some cool stuff, no SQL guys. But hey, we're going to add some NoSQL features to our databases. So IBM, uh, Informix, anybody use Informix? Anybody heard of Informix? They have JSON now in their databases. Oracle is adding JSON fields. PostgreSQL adds some really, really good JSON functionality. I'm almost, I don't, almost don't want to say how good it is because um, you might pick them over Couchbase. But uh, MySQL is adding some basic JSON formatting. Um, Microsoft has DocumentDB, which is their cloud-based database, that actually has a rudimentary SQL querying system as well. So all these vendors are starting to introduce JSON features. So you have the NoSQL side that's, that says, okay, we're going to have, you know, you've got key value and MapReduce, and maybe we'll start adding SQL queries. You have the other side, relational side, saying, well, we have tables and, and store procedures, and we're going to start adding some NoSQL functionality. So what you start to see is a little bit of a convergence here in database technologies, which I think is cool. We're going in the right direction. Couchbase saw this and said, hey, let's start creating our own implementation of SQL for a JSON document database. And around the same time they started working on that, the University of California, San Diego, announced they're working on this paper called SQL++, which is exactly that. It's a SQL language for non-relational JSON document type data. So Couchbase and UC San Diego collaborated on this, and I think Nickel is maybe, maybe the first official implementation of SQL++ in a, in a database. And so you can find more about that here, excuse me, at this link, links to the white paper and the academics and all that whole uh, stuff there. So what Couchbase essentially did was validate their paper in a real implementation inside Couchbase. This is one of the things that really drew me to Couchbase um, in the first place. So with a SQL, normal SQL, what you get is you get some set of tables, you join them together through a SQL query that you write, and what you get is a result set. So it's kind of like a table with, with rows in it. With nickel, what you get is one document or maybe multiple documents. If you remember, this document represents sort of the equivalent of five plus tables itself. You run that through nickel, and your result is also JSON perhaps even a complex, you know, embedded set of, of documents in JSON. So in order to do this, you have to, you have to, you can start with SQL, but you have to add some additional functionality because you're dealing with a different type of data than rows and columns. So you need to be able to fully address and access any part of a document. So how do you, I mean, if you say name, just say, you know, document dot, you know, name, right? But how do you say this type here, billing type? So maybe a dotted notation, right? What if I want this, the second in the array there? Another, maybe array notation with some square brackets and a number for an index. And you have to handle the flexibility of documents because these are so flexible. There may be some documents that have a field and some documents that are missing that same field. So you have to have the way to express, is this field there or is it missing? Which is different from saying, is this field value null? Right? It's there, but it has a null value versus it's not there at all. Which you can't have in, in a table. The column's either there or it's not there. Okay, so here are some nickel examples. I'll give you a second to just Check that out real quick. There may be a couple things that look strange to you, but for the most part, this looks like normal SQL to me. So 
So one of those features that is specific to JSON is this unnest keyword. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. We're all, we can also see that in our insert, we can put in a literal JSON object and insert that. Instead of specifying each field and value individually, we can, specify, we can just drop in a literal JSON object. And the update looks pretty much identical to normal SQL. So this is another example of a select. You can see that we have some dotted notation here. So if I have this customer's bucket that I'm selecting from, maybe I want to navigate to the name field and then the last name part of that name object. So I, I can dot all the way down to the very deep levels of my hierarchy there. Well, it's case sensitive, that's, yeah, that's fine. And then we have unnest here which is kind of like a join, but it's a join within the document itself. You can think of it like an embedded join. And we'll, you'll, you'll see an example of that in a second here. You can also join to other documents based on their key, their document key. And we can do some cool stuff with sum and having and order by and group by, the kind of stuff you'd expect from a regular SQL implementation. Uh, right now, join only works on the document keys just FYI, you can't join from one field to another field. You can join from one field to another key. You can compose them, just like real SQL. So here I've got a select, I've got an embedded union inside of that. So I mean, this is not a token implementation of SQL. This is a full SQL implementation and then some. So I don't want to, I don't want to, I could spend all day covering the spec for nickel, but let's just hit some highlights here. Uh, I did mention you can query across relationships with the joins and with subqueries. Um, you can use the aggregate methods that you're used to, min, max, average, and so on. You can combine result sets using union, intercept, intersect, accept. Use keys is the way you could select documents based on the document ID. So give me the documents that have keys A, B, C. You can join from one field to another document's key. Talked about that already. You can nest, which is kind of like a, a write join, uh, but within a document itself. And then unnest is sort of the opposite of that. You can take a sub uh, a sub-document array and flatten it out. And I'll, I'll show you that, um, a live example. So that's, that's kind of hard for me to explain. It's easier to show. And then join nest and unnest can be changed in any combination, just like uh, you, know, you could do with a regular SQL, with joins and left joins and right joins. So let's get to some demoing. I know you guys are anxious to see some real code here. So this is, I've got Couchbase here running locally on my machine. It's just localhost 8091. Um, I have one node running. So I talked earlier about you can have multiple nodes in a cluster. This is just for development purposes, so I just have one node running here. In Couchbase, data is put into things called buckets. And so a bucket represents a collection of related documents. Typically, you want to use one bucket per application. It's sort of a rough guideline. It's not a requirement, but it's a rough guideline. So for instance, this travel sample, which I'll be querying today, it actually comes as a sample set of data with Couchbase Server. It includes a lot of um, stuff like airlines and routes and landmarks and things like that. And that's 31,000 documents in that bucket. So it's, it's not really a table because all the documents are, can be you know, different fields and different structures. Uh, but it's not really a database either because it's kind of like there's multiple buckets per cluster. So it's just kind of a, a loose collection of documents that are related to each other for their application. Each document in a bucket has to have a unique key. So there is that constraint on it. All right, so let's start with some queries here. Uh, 
Um, let's, let's just do something simple here first. Let's select star from travel sample where type equals route. Why oh, didn't that work? Make five. Hmm. Common type route. Did I spell route right? Yeah. I don't know why that's not working. Let's try. Let's try this one here. Okay. It's a little more complex. Let me zoom in here so you can see it. All right, so what I'm doing is I'm selecting these fields, and I've, I've got these aliases on here, RNA, just like you can do in SQL, from, and this is a bucket name, so travel sample. I'm aliasing that as R. All right, so I'm selecting some fields from that bucket, R, 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 right there. And let me skip the join for now, but I'm saying, give me all the documents in travel sample that have a field source airport that has this value, and destination airport that has this value, and order them by the... Uh, well, skip that part for now, too. So I'm selecting from a bucket that has a source airport and a destination airport. And that's going to return routes, because routes have those two fields. Now I want to join, again, to the same bucket. I'm going to alias it with A this time, because I'm going to join those routes, each have an airline ID field, and that's going to correspond to a document that contains information about the airline, so like United Air or American Airlines. So there's a relationship here between the documents. And then I'm going to order by the airline name, which I'm also selecting in the query there. So the results of that look like this JSON over here, which may be kind of hard to visualize, so there's a table view here. So that's, that's the result here. This is the destination airport. And uh, the equipment ID, so that's the, that's, this is still part of the route. This is the R, right? Yeah, R. And then I'm, I've joined to another document here for American Airlines, because that's the, that's the airline ID that this document contains a reference to, kind of like a foreign key. And then each route has a schedule, which is an array of more documents. So it's kind of like a table within a table. And if I scroll, so there's two results here. If I scroll down, you see the other one that corresponds to U.S. Airways. They're both San Francisco to Miami. So before I go any further, any questions on this query so far? Is this making any sense? Am I explaining it poorly? Yes. Two questions. Go ahead. First is out of sheer curiosity. Yeah. Couchbase is partially written in Erlang, yes, yes. That's how we get a lot of the, you know, you distributed computing going. Uh, part of it's written in Go, I think, as well, and there's some parts written in, in Java, and, and uh, I think this UI might be in Angular, okay. things like that, yeah. Okay, and then my second question is related to this specifically. I'm a little confused on joining the table on itself. It's not a table. No, yeah, not a table. I'm joining <laughs> the document on itself. I'm joining the, the whole bucket. Right, so I mean, think of this. You can so in SQL, you can join a table to itself too. Have you done that before? I mean, that's it's a very similar sort of concept here. But um, on this R, I'm I'm qualifying it, I'm saying where the document has source airport and destination airport. So I'm, so this R is going to be limited to just those documents that have those specific values that I'm choosing. San Francisco to Miami, and then I'm going to join it because each of those documents is going to have a field called airline ID. Okay, maybe if I put that in here, airline ID, you can see that this is, this is the foreign key that this route has, airline underscore 24. So if I join that to this travel sample bucket, and I'm saying join it on that key, yeah. airline ID, it's going to go out and find other documents that have that key of airline 24. And there's only going to be one, which is American Airlines. Yes. That match this, that match this key. Yeah. Oh, okay. Right. Right now, that's that's the restriction. Has to be a key. Okay. 
So, uh, that's my last question. I think so. But, uh, the airline audience, I mean, all that stuff, because yeah. that was like the big flight you can see go to the source airport. Um, it's basically like doing a, like a group buy and then like kind of rolling it up based on those keys. I mean, like you have the RID and then the airline ID, right? And so, like, yeah. is it always going to be kind of grouped where you just have like your title keys and then you have like all the extraneous information that pairs with that? Um, like let me be repeating. So yeah. um, let me let me just take this schedule out. Maybe this will clear things up a little bit. So this is without the schedule field included. Now I just have these fields. Right. And this looks very much like a like a SQL right. result, right? Yeah, yeah. But each of those documents has an array in it, right. and that's what I'm selecting this for. Right. But I'm just saying, whenever you do that, then you'll just have like your title kind of. Mm -hmm. equipment and all that, and yeah. then you're going to have your, like, your flight schedules and the flight like, with it. Right, so this, is, this is one field. So if you can imagine this as, let's say in a regular table, you would just encode some JSON and put that into a varchar or something like that. But this is richer than that because this is actually represented as another collection, an array in there, which we can actually query. We can actually um, you know, uh, make determinations on that data. Yes, I can show the JSON version, right. It's a little harder to put on the screen. This is why I don't just show it. But there's the, sort of the plain you know, field value, field value. Now here's one that's more complex. It's an array. And it contains you know, some n number of objects in that array. OK. Yeah, go ahead. Yes. So that a yes. That's a good question. So the, the question is, how do I know that there, these fields exist? How do I figure out the structure of these documents? And so one is that you're going to be the one designing them, typically. You're going to be designing what these documents look like as you store them. So you have that information. Two is a relatively new feature to Couchbase over here, this bucket analysis. And what this does is the documents in Couchbase bucket, they don't have to have anything in common at all. They can be completely different. Every single document, it's heterogeneous. It can be any number of documents in there. But typically, you're going to have a repetition of the same structure over and over in those documents, right? It's typically going to look, there's going to be a lot of commonality between some of those documents. So if that's our hypothesis, what we can do is we can take a random sample of documents in the bucket, see what they have in common, and sort them into a sort of inferred schema into different flavors of documents. So if you look down here at the bottom left, I've run an analysis on the travel sample. It says it found five flavors of documents. So the first one has some things in common. First thing it finds is that they have type equals route in common. So chances are these documents represent routes. If I keep going, there'll be another flavor that has some things in common. One of them is type equals landmark. So there's another set of documents there that are, that are landmarks, that have a lot of things in common, and so on. There's five flavors in total here, I think. Uh, the fifth one is, well, that's a weird one. I don't know what that is. 0.1%, um, probably not important. So 3%. 3% of our documents are probably hotels. They're documents that contain information about hotels. So based on this, we could say, well, we know that these documents are type hotel, so I could query on that field. I could query on these fields in the hotel or query for them. Address, check-in, check-out, city, do they have free breakfast, so on. So this sort of infers the schema. Even though you're not held to this, it just sort of makes a statistical guess about the structure of your documents. So that's a very helpful tool for building queries, especially if maybe you're not the one to originally design it in the first place. You can only join documents to another document on, um, on uh, you can, <laughs> so the, the field in the first document can only be joined to another document's key. That's correct. You can join within the document itself, which is called the nest and unnest, which I'll show you in a second. But you can't join from one field to another field between documents, at least not yet. 
Okay. All right, let's bring in another one here. So I'm going to, it's basically the same query, except now I'm going to, oh, whoa, that's really small. I'm going to add another line here, unnest. So that R schedule field, that was the whole embedded table, embedded array of, of documents, I'm going to unnest that into S, another alias. And then from that, I'm going to say, give me the flights and give me the time. And add that to my select. So if we run that, remember we had two results before. It looked like this. One result, two results. I'm going to execute this query. Now we have 52 results. It's flattened out that array. And this is the actual JSON. So you can see it's flat JSON. We've put the flight and the time flattened it out with the rest of that data. So now we have 52 results instead of two. So there's the American Airlines, and then there's the US Airways. So it's sort of acting as a join, but it's within the array that's already inside the document. This is a concept that you don't have in, in relational databases. So that's why we've added this unnest functionality to nickel. Yes, that's correct. I mean, it, it's basically joining that array that's already implicitly joined to the document, but it's joining it in such a way that now it flattens out the data. Yeah, that was my question why I didn't do that earlier. Right, right. Yeah, so. so this is how you do it on Nest. Yeah. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> okay. All right, we'll do one more thing here. Just to, just one minor thing. I'm going to add a, another part to this where query here. I'm going to say, okay, I've broken those down, all those routes and all those flights. I want to get just the ones that are on Sunday. And in, in the travel industry, day zero is Sunday. I'm not really sure why that is, but that's the way, that's the way it is. I'm going to execute that. And now I get nine results. So these are just the Sunday flights from San Francisco to Miami. Uh, so there's four on American Airlines, and there's uh, five on U.S. Airways. Okay, so uh, any more questions about this? There's a lot more. There's a, there's a very rich spec with nickel. Here's just a quick cheat sheet um, that shows you some examples. So just all the kinds of things you'd expect from a normal SQL language are all here, plus some. So Null and missing. I touched on it already. Where, you know, find from the tutorial where children is null is different than if children is missing. Because that means the children field isn't even there. Versus there is a children field, but its value is null. Um, explain is a pretty cool way to see what kind of indexing your query is using. So that way you know if you're hitting your index or not, and that's going to help you with performance. Um, dealing with arrays, a length of arrays, you can add stuff to arrays, append, concatenate. Here's um, some cheat sheet on join nest and unnest, which are all kinds of joins, really. And, uh, and yeah, there's, there's a lot more beyond this. There's a whole collection of other stuff, which we'll touch on when I get back to the slides here. But any more questions before I jump out of query workbench? We can always come back if you want to, but if you think of something, yeah. Um, I hadn't planned on it, but I mean, I, I probably can. If you want to, let's do that towards the end. Yeah, sure, sure. Okay. All right, let's go back over here. All right. So just uh, another quick summary. You can do ranges. So any and every are important. So if, you, if you have arrays in your documents, you want to say if there's any children in this array that has an age over 10, I want to include that document, or you can say where every uh, element in that array has some value. Oh, we have a nested traversal, so you have dot notation, you have array notation. Um, you can construct things dynamically in your SQL statements. 
This is missing. We touched on that already. The data types that we support in Nickel are the same ones you'd see in JSON. So these four, these first four are kind of similar to regular relational databases, but we have arrays and objects, which are kind of unique to JSON document databases. Let me circle those for you. And uh, missing, so we mentioned that already, we mentioned that several times now. Also binary. Couchbase does have a way to store binary information in the value of the document if you wanted to do that. And you can still use nickel, but you lose some of the ability to query what's in that binary document because you can't reason about it the same way you can reason about a JSON document. So there are some, uh, I mean, JSON doesn't have a date type, notoriously, but there are some date functions in Nickel to handle uh, Unix timestamp data, string dates. Um, there's functions for that in Nickel. There's some semantics for order by, comparisons. Um, there's our, there are defined expression semantics for all the input data types. So that means you're not going to get a lot of type mismatch errors. And you can also select a string as an integer, for instance, if the, if the string uh, is an integer. Right? There's a function to convert that. Data modification statements, so you mentioned update. There's certainly update there. Delete, insert, merge, which is actually relatively new to SQL Server. It's part of Nickel as well. Um, one thing I should note about this is that Couchbase doesn't support the idea of transactions in the same way that SQL does. So if you're doing an update on, say, 10 documents, it's not all or nothing. So if one of those fails, the other nine will still succeed. So it's per document atomicity, not per batch, per transaction atomicity. Uh, we don't have transactions, at least not yet. Uh, here's some more data modification. So I, I mentioned the, the literals before. You can just put a JSON literal right in there. Uh, here's an update. So that's what it looks like but um, we can work on one that actually I can demonstrate later. Delete works as well. Those are all uh, cool ways to modify your data. Uh, indexes are very important, perhaps even more important than in a SQL database because they're not, you know, in a SQL database they're per table, but in Couchbase they're per bucket, and buckets can be really, really huge containing all kinds of documents. So it's very important to create good indexes, otherwise you're going to have performance issues. So creating indexes, dropping indexes, important. Explaining your query to make sure you're hitting the index you expect it to hit is important. Uh, I could talk about indexing for probably a whole day. Instead, I'm going to direct you to this blog post here that contains probably the seven, eight different types of indexes you can create on a Couchbase bucket. So again, this is real SQL here. This is real, you know, full rich SQL. It's not just you know, in SQL in name only. You have full indexing capabilities here. Uh, functional indexes are that. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, just one quick question about indexes, and that is, sure. how are they implemented? Are they implemented as a, a document somewhere, or? Um, they're not, well, I don't, I don't think they're implemented as a document. If they are, they're not, you can't see them in, as a document in, the, in say, the uh, Couchbase console. I don't know the details of how they're implemented. I know that there is an indexing service that you can install with, with Couchbase on each node or on individual nodes. And that's a way you can, you can do multi-dimensional scaling. You could, put, you could set aside some nodes just for indexing, for instance, and give them faster processors or whatever. Um, so I don't know the details of how they're implemented. But um, I can show you some when we go back to the console. That, there's, that travel sample comes with a collection of like seven indexes out of the box. So you can see them listed all there and you can um, give you some idea of what's going on. Okay. All right. Uh, so just another quick word on indexes here. You can create a primary index which is on the keys of the documents and that's sort of the bare minimum index you can create. It's important to create secondary indexes. So here's an example document uh, with a key of customer 534. Excuse me. I'm going to create an index here on customer based on the card number and the postal code. So I get that dotted notation here as well. 
So I can index even on these embedded hierarchical fields, which may be important for your queries depending on what you're doing. So there's another example there, another example there. It can be created with any combination of attribute names. And it's, it's very useful and vital and important, especially if you have very large sets of data, which in a NoSQL database you're typically going to. And there needs to be the right key ordering as well, which I think a lot of databases do that uh, sort of thing. So indexing, very important, very complex topic, and I definitely recommend that, that blog post if you're interested in that. So let's go revisit our high value customers query. So we had this whole rigmarole that we had to code earlier using key values and MapReduce and sorting it in memory and the whole thing. This can be replaced with this nice expressive SQL query down here instead, which is, I think you'll agree, much nicer and much easier and also familiar compared to writing all that code at the top there, which may be a combination of, of JavaScript and SDK calls and so on. So a quick summary here of SQL compared to NoSQL. Again, I don't want to bash SQL. There's lots of great stuff there. But we've got some other cool stuff in Nickel as well to deal with the, uh, you know, the potentially flexible, unstructured, or you know, loosely structured data. So nesting and unnesting. You can address all the JSON fields and have a flexible document structure. All right. I'm going to talk briefly about working with Couchbase with .NET, specific, specifically with Nickel via .NET. If you are not a .NET developer, don't zone out, because this stuff all applies to Java and Node and Ruby APK or SDKs as well. We do have a standard ODBC driver. Anybody still use ODBC or JDBC out there? I'm sorry if you do. But we do have a standard driver provided by one of our partners named Simba. They provide a lot of drivers for NoSQL databases. So if you have a reporting application like Crystal or Excel that uses ODBC, you can just plug it into Couchbase and, and use that as a driver as well. And uh, yeah. Um, so you could, if you wanted to, even write this into your application, build ODBC, but uh, don't do that. Use the Use the normal SDK, which I'll show you in a second here. But this does give you the ability to use your existing BI tools and your existing stuff like Excel, which I'll show you in a second here, to plug into your data and address it just like you would any normal database. What this does is Simba provides this tool. It converts your standard SQL 92, your ANSI SQL. It takes that in and it converts it to Nickel. And that's the cool part of what Simba's doing, is it's converting it over um, via that driver. Now you get full 64 and 32-bit support, and you get full SQL support as well. And that says JDBC on the slide. I didn't change that yet. It should say ODBC. But both of them are provided. So here's an example of how you might do that. And this was traumatizing for me to write this code, guys. I hope you appreciate this, because I haven't done ODB stuff since I got out of college. Um, but I, have, I set up a DSN, if you guys are familiar with that. Anybody know? For Simba, you don't have to use a DSN. You could use a connection string, but that was easier. Connection open, create command. Here's the command text. Now, this is not nickel right here. This is your ANSI SQL. That's what gets converted into nickel. When I run this uh, reader here and write out all the results and close the connection. So if you're using your BI tools, you can still use them with Couchbase. All you gotta do is plug in this, this Simba driver. You can also, if you're feeling adventurous, you can just say, use nickel mode, bypass the ANSI SQL, and give it a normal nickel query, which might give you a little bit of performance boost, I think, because the translation doesn't have to take place. So again, I'm not sure why you do this in favor of using the SDK, but it is possible. Here's how you do it with the .NET SDK directly. So we're out of ODBC land. We're back into the Couchbase .NET SDK or Java SDK or whatever. And I say, create a query, select 
select p.star from bucket name, order by p.name. And then I say bucket, which I got earlier in the code, which I sort of omitted here, but bucket query to person. So it'll map the results of that query into a collection of person objects, and then rows to actually get that collection. This supports parameterization, which is important because yes, you can use SQL injection on a NoSQL database. And also supports uh, asynchronous queries. So if you're doing .NET or Node, or whatever Java uses, you have no problem. You can just use query async instead of query. So you have full asynchronicity. One of the cool things I like about .NET is this open source library called Link to Couchbase. This is not an official Couchbase product, at least not yet, not officially supported, but it's a very mature um, link implementation for Couchbase. So you could just say query person. You don't even have to write nickel. You just use order by and a, a to list, and that's going to map to a collection of, of person objects. This is going to generate nickel behind the scenes for you, much like Entity Framework generates SQL or NHibernate generates SQL. You can do it with Couchbase, with nickel. All right, we'll talk briefly about the ecosystem out there. So thanks to Simba, we have integration with all these well-known BI tools, including uh, Excel and Power BI, Tableau, all those other ones out there. Anything uses ODBC. We also have some other integrations um, with some tools that don't use ODBC, like Elasticsearch or Spark. And they use a Couchbase specific protocol called DCP or XDCR to integrate with Couchbase. So this, we're not just limited by ODBC. There's also some other integrations for like big data and other tools like Elasticsearch. You can integrate with Couchbase. Here's a screenshot of Excel connecting to that travel sample. So if I wanted to go through the query wizard in Excel, anybody here a big fan of the query wizard? This is Excel. You could use the access as well, but you can connect to it, select the column. So it still calls it tables and columns because this is Excel. So it's, it's sort of uh, hiding the details there. And uh, oh yes, this screen, ah, such memories. But this is, of course, generating sort of a, a, a GUI to generate SQL. And that's what this is doing here. We're selecting all the routes that have Miami and, and San Francisco. And you can see the results here in, in table form. You know, I didn't scroll over far enough to see what the actual, uh, um, what was it, the flight array? What that actually renders as. That would be interesting. Uh, okay, and then uh, to try Nickel, we have an online web-based, you don't have to install anything, Nickel tutorial. It's interactive. So it's like a guided tour through Nickel, but you can type in your own tweaks and experiment with it. I think there are some things that are prohibited just for security reasons, but for the most part, you can play with that as much as you want. Go crazy on those nickel queries. If you have any questions or problems as you're doing that, feel free to contact me. I'll, I'll help you or uh, find someone who can. All right, so I've got those stickers right here. They look like some of these pictures right here. Anybody tweeted during this uh, session? Come and get your sticker afterwards. I'd be happy to give you one. Or if you just really ask me nicely, I'll give you a sticker. You can find us on the, all these places here. Um, Couchbase Dev is our developer community Twitter account. I definitely recommend following that. Or hash Couchbase. We're always looking at hash Couchbase for people doing cool stuff with Couchbase or people complaining about Couchbase. That's our job. We need to interact with the developers. And sometimes that's good. Sometimes it's not so good. Uh, forums are broken up by the SDK, so if you're a .NET person, we have a forum for you. If you're Ruby or Java, we have a forum for you. We also monitor Stack Overflow carefully. That's me, M. Groves. Follow me on Twitter. Or let me know who you are, and I'll follow you on Twitter. If you don't want to listen to my insane ramblings. I've also been told to show you this slide here to uh, give me some feedback. And you'll, you could win a $50 Best Buy gift card. So fill this out. Seriously, though, it's, it's hard for us to get feedback sometimes as speakers. So I appreciate Tulsa Tech Fest doing, doing this for us. So if you guys could fill that out, I would appreciate it. And don't forget to say thank you to our sponsors on the way out. 
they, they work hard to help us give the pizza to you and all that kind of stuff. So we got plenty of time left, guys. So if you have questions or anything, come up, come up to me and we'll, we'll talk or, or hack away on Couchbase or whatever you want to do. Thank you very much. And thank you for coming to Tulsa Tech Fest.